Hi everyone. Oh, love is in the air with some nice Valentine's Day gifts. So I got these from my students. Uh, one says, I'm a good teacher from Random. Okay. And I got some nice candy, a nice heart lollipop and some candy. Ooh, from her secret admirer. Gee, I wonder who got that could be. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> so, love is in the air, Valentine's Day, the February 14th, and it's time for me to make what I love to do best, making videos about my teas or tarantulas. So, today's video, we're going to be recording a tarantula myth bus review of 54, which is something that I've been postponing for a while now, and finally I have some time to make it. So, Mythbuster videos, basically, if you guys watch it, they serve as a, an in-depth care sheet on what you know about the species, how much they go for, uh, their temperament, breeding, care, uh, care requirements, uh, growth rate, size, and of course cost, and my personal recommendations from owning said tarantula for a couple of years. So today we're going to be doing the Cochana Bruneeps, which is the Brazilian dwarf pink lake, and we're going to look up back to my chalkboard and we're going to go with some, look at some information. Okay, so with our new chalkboard, we're going to go one by one all the topics that we're going to discuss in this video, uh, namely the common name, the scientific name, how you pronounce it, uh, the lifespan and growth rate, uh, the sizes of it, uh, what they look like, how much do they go for, their basic care sheet, uh, temperament, breeding, if any information, and recommendations is basically if I recommend them for a beginner, intermediate, or uh, experienced keeper. So today we're going to do just that. So the common name of this particular spider, obviously, because I said it in the video and it's on the title, it's the Brazilian Dwarf Pink Lake. So what you can expect for the species knowing uh, the common name, well obviously common names are really not to be used well because some of them are really vague in general, but we do know that this is a dwarf species that, you know, it's under three inches, uh, they're from Brazil, so we can say that it's a new world, either terrestrial or arboreal, and they're not going to have significant venom because they should possess urticating hairs. Now, the scientific name of this species is uh, Cochiana or Cochiana brunips or brunipes. And how we pronounce it is uh, Cochiana brunipes. So it's a pretty real nice name to uh, figure out and it's relatively easy to pick it up and memorize. Alrighty, there's my little Cochiana Bruni piece, which is the Brazilian dwarf pink leg. This is what they actually look like. Uh, so I'm going to go off screen right now and uh, do a little blurb on what they look like uh, using uh, the pictures from Tarantula Canada. All right, so sorry for the archaic work here. So what I did is I took Tarantula Canada's uh, gallery and compare the images side by side and put this on Movie Maker for me to narrate. So you can definitely see the, the two opposite differences, the males on the left and the females on the right. So at first glance, they kind of appear to show somewhat of a sexual dimorphism, which means that the male and female look different than each other. Uh, now, it's not a very strong sexual dimorphism like for example, uh, Pisotheria, where the males and females are completely different, or Panthabedius, uh, where the males are actually much more beautiful than uh, the females. So uh, you can see right away why they call the Brazilian dwarf pink leg because of the pink legs on the female. Uh, on the screen, it kind of looks like a rustic orange color, but when they freshly molt, uh, they kind of appear somewhat pink in color. Now, the males, uh, as juvenile and immature, uh, they st will look identical to the females, except when they mature, that's when they start to look like the specimen on the left. And now, all that orange color or pinkish color will be replaced by a dark brown slash beige color. 
So uh, the mature male Cochiana brunipes will have tibial hooks, and as all mature males do, they have the bulbous pedipalps, and which they need to inject sperm into uh, the female's uh, spermatheci. Now, with that said, the growth rate of Cochiana brunipes is exceptionally fast. Uh, if you look on my video on the video description, which I'm being leaking now, that is the very first video that I bought my Kachiana Bruni peas, which was on December 20th, 2014. And if you follow my feeding videos since then, uh, so that was 111 to uh, the current 140, uh, you can really see the mapping of how my uh, Bruni peas actually grew and she is an exceptionally fast grower and within two years I had an adult female. Now it really depends on how often you feed them. If you feed them once a week uh, you'll probably get an adult specimen within a year, year and a half. Uh, with males will probably be a couple of months again if you feed them well like meaning by power feed them, feed them more than once a week. Now, everyone knows my schedule that I feed them once a month. Basically, just watch my feeding videos, notice the dates when they upload them. That's usually representative of when I feed them. And you can see that my specimen matured out in two years, which is awesome. Now, because of their insane growth rate, they're not going to be as long-lived as a typical uh, beginner species like uh, G. Poteri or B. Hamori. Uh, females will generally live around 10 to 15 years, whereas mature males will live around 2 to 5, depending on how uh, often you uh, feed them. And it's a shame because uh, they're a really nice species. Basically, the, the the top max size for these Cochiana bruni peas, uh, generally females, uh, they get up to around an inch and a half to about two inches. So they're not very big species. This is why they call them dwarfs. So obviously males are going to be a lot smaller. Uh, they're going to possess urticating, well, no, urticating hairs, they all do. Uh, they're going to have tibial hooks and they're going to have... Um, bulbous pedipalps, which they all do, and generally they max out, I, I'm going to say at least about an inch, inch and a quarter. Uh, so they're not very big at all compared to the females. They should be half the size. Uh, now, the cost for them, they generally range. Uh, back in 2014 when I bought Kagome, uh, she, she was about a half an inch. I paid about $45 Canadian. Uh, Tarantula Canada is selling uh, one eighth inch for ten dollars and they're virtually inexpensive. I went to tangledandwebs.com in Canada uh, they are selling a adult female for eighty dollars so pretty much they're a affordable tarantula very cheap to obtain however because of the rarity they might change in price depending on the seller so I think eighty dollars for an adult female it's a real good deal especially uh, since uh, females are very hard to come by in general, especially Kachiana broody peas. Uh, for US, um, I mean, I haven't really seen any prices uh, for them. I, I would expect them to be at least uh, 40 to $50 uh, US uh, per natal female and probably like five ten dollars for a uh, spiderling. So again, look on the video description. I'm going to be putting on all of the links to uh, the dealers that I know from, from Canada, from the US, and uh, UK, and Europe. So uh, you'll be able to look and see in general what they sell and what they go for. So for care requirements, uh, these are pretty simple. If you checked my Mythbuster video 36, uh, the one that I did on the uh, Cirrocosmos species, it's pretty much the same thing as well as this will apply to Haplopus species if you have uh, the pumpkin patch, the large form, or the small form. Now, Kagome, uh, I house her in a 16 ounce deli cup with enough structure to burrow and she's fine. She's adult and she's not gonna go any bigger. So keep in mind, these guys will get up to about an inch and a half to two inches as mature adults. So you don't really need um, you know, a five gallon tank or 10 gallon tank, that's, that's overkill. So you can either house them in a small deli cup or if you want to go a little bit bigger, I understand there's a lot of people that want to have space for their teas. 
Uh, you can house them in a two liter shoebox enclosure. Just make sure that you make some air holes around the, the perimeter of the enclosure and you're all set. So make sure you have enough substrate to burrow because these guys are obligate burrows. So they need to burrow or else uh, they can become very stressed if they can't. Uh, so temper, uh, Temperature, uh, basically most tarantulas in my care, they thrive at room temperature. So if you can keep it between 73 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, you're, you're all set. You don't really need to go more than 80 or lower than you know 65. 65 is a bit too cold for um, most tarantulas. Okay, so humidity is the ability for uh, the tarantula to get water and you want to know, it's important to know how much water that you want to provide to your uh, tarantula. Obviously water is crucial, you should always provide water to your tarantula. So uh, for Cotiana bruni peas, uh, they generally like it on the semi-arid side. So uh, the best way to accomplish that is to keep part of your enclosure a little bit on the dry side and the other half a little bit on the slightly moist side and rotate in between. So that way uh, it's nice uh, environment because they do come from Brazil and sometimes they do get high humidity. So the way I like to do it, I never mist. Misting is just taking the spritzer and go psh, 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 psh. The problem is with misting is that you, when you're spraying, you're only spraying the top layers, right? And when you have condensation occurring when you're closing the enclosure and it's really warm, your, all your water that you sprayed is just going to disappear in a blink of an eye. So you really don't want to do that. So what I like to do is to soak the substrate uh, with lukewarm water to warm water and pour enough so I see triplets or yeah, triplets of water hitting uh, the bottom layer. That's when I know that uh, I'm really getting humidity in there and it's real it's a real nice way to keep up humidity because that actually lasts a lot longer than just spritzing it because spritzing it generally will stress out your tarantula uh, you're gonna get an escapee and you're going to freak out so I just literally soak the substrate until I see bottom layers get a little bit wet and that's it and sometimes I rotate a check every, a check every few days so if it's totally dry I give it a little slight soaking and and that's about it for the care sheet. A really, real simple tarantula to care take care of, and uh, you really shouldn't have any problems uh, keeping uh, these guys alive. Super easy. Um, now for feeding response, these guys have an amazing feeding response. Uh, you've seen that in most of my feeding videos. Kagome is one of the highlights of them. Uh, throw a cricket in there, bang, she eats it. Enough said, right? Uh, temperament, uh, these guys are on the skittish side. Uh, they generally don't tend to flick urticating hair, at least I've never seen Kagomi flick it, but she's very fast and not so much defensive. So she's not gonna go and uh, bite you or uh, do threat postures like my other ones, like my crazy peak and Saturdays. These guys will just, they're, they're very shy. Like and they're and they're seclusive, so they mainly they'll tend to run away from your disturbance rather than try to fight it. So I mistakenly handled mine, uh, well, a couple of weeks ago, and I should have recorded it. But in general, like she was fine, and I had no problems uh, putting her in her enclosure, very calm but very fast. And in general, I don't recommend handling them because of their fast nature. Uh, you don't want to handle your tarantulas too high because what happens is that they'll fall, uh, their abdomen is going to burst open and uh, basically because they don't have platelets in their blood, uh, they're not able to coagulate it and they're just going to bleed out to death and it'll be a sad day in your tea room. Right. Okay. So temperament I covered, breeding, uh, I don't really have any information on breeding these species. I've checked arachnivores, uh, they don't really seem to have much information. Uh, from what I know from what Tarantula Canada has been doing, uh, that's Martin and Amanda, uh, they have been successfully reproducing uh, these uh, spiders. Uh, generally pretty easy to mate. I would say the gestation periods will be somewhere between three to six months after your uh, initial mating. Uh, 
spiralings are really, really small. Uh, they're about eighth, an eighth of an inch when uh, they're born. So they're really small and the way to feed these guys is to uh, give them real small pinheads uh, uh, chopped and or uh, flat this fruit flies. Oh, here's another one I left out, venom. Now for Cochiana bruni peas, uh, because they're very similar to uh, Cirrocosmos and Care, uh, and they come from a similar region, their venom is medically insignificant or in other layman's terms, weak. So basically, uh, if you were to ever get bitten by the species, uh, the only adverse effects that you'll likely get is a little bit itching and a little redness, which will go away within 10 to 15 minutes of the bite. So uh, pretty much a very safe tarantula if you were to get bitten by it. It's not like uh, a piece of Lotharia or a Trinochilus uh, murinus, where if you got bitten by that one, then you would have cramps all over for a whole week and you feel like you want to go to the hospital. With Kachiana, uh, they're pretty much safe. Now in general, these guys, although that they're easy to keep and they would be an ideal recommendation for a beginner, uh, their temperament kind of makes them more lenient towards the intermediate keeper because they're fast. And, I personally would not recommend any fast tarantulas for someone that's really new to tarantulas because they need to get their feet wet with knowing how to care for a spider before they can deal with a little faster and more defensive species. So I think these guys are an excellent addition and a must have in your collection even though that uh, they're kind of rare and they really should not be rare. Uh, these guys should be more common in the hobby. Hopefully we can get a lot of breeding done and hopefully we'll breed these guys in the future and make them less pricey and more available. And these guys are often confused with Cirrocosmos verte because I'll show you the picture right now. As you can see, they kind of look the same. Uh, so, um, yeah, and I kind I kind of looks like a little miniature version of Brachypalma classy because these guys have excellent class. <laughs> All right, guys. So hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned for another MythBuster video in about two to three weeks' time. And I will likely touch up on the Spirbophria hofmani, which is the Central American horned bird eater, because I have it, and there's no MythBuster video on it, so. Why not? All right, guys, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and comment. Leave a like on the video, comment on what you like or dislike about this video, and that's about it. All right, guys, enjoy.